This is a survey of international economics course. So it's a one semester overview of what we also teach in a two semester version. We break up international economics into a micro component and a macro component, just like economics is broken up at the introductory stage. We talk about microeconomics related to international, we call it international trade. When we talk about macroeconomics related to international, we call it international finance, or sometimes international monetary theory, uh, or sometimes international macro. This course is going to be a combination of both of those. What this course does, and what I do in it, is I pull from those courses what I think are the most important, the most essential lessons that you need to understand uh, to have an awareness of the issues, policy issues, and the methods of analysis and the economic understandings uh, that are out there with respect to international trade and international finance issues. So that's what this course is about in a nutshell. We're going to start by working our way through the international macro or international finance section of the course. The quick distinction between micro and macro, if it's been a while since you've taken economics, is uh, macro is going to look at economic aggregate variables, things that are summed up across the entire economy. Things like the gross domestic product, which we're going to look at in, in some detail today. Gross domestic product is a measure of output within an economy, but it's output summed up across all of the firms that are producing all sorts of different products and services across an entire year of production. It's aggregated, macro, big picture. And we look at how variables, uh, other macroeconomic variables, like the inflation rate, the unemployment rate, the level of consumption, the amount of exports from a country, the amount of imports, all of these are aggregated variables, and we'd like to understand, if we can, the interrelationships between them. How do changes in one affect the other? And how could we potentially steer an economy towards a more acceptable outcome in terms of the macroeconomic data that we measure and report and seem to care so much about. And we'll talk a little bit about that, a lot about that as we go along. So that's the finance side. In the finance side, we're going to focus a lot of attention on two macroeconomic variables of great importance in international. One is the trade balance, uh, trade deficits and surpluses. I mean, you've heard a little bit about that probably in the current uh, presidential campaign. It comes up from time to time. And you're going to learn everything you need to know about them, I hope. Uh, we're also going to talk a lot about exchange rates and how exchange rates are determined, different forms of implementing exchange rates, different policies that countries can pursue. And we'll look at policy issues relating to both of these issues as we build them together and into the uh, kind of a macroeconomic structure so that we can understand some of these interrelationships. So we'll do that in the first half of the class. The second half of the class is going to cover international trade. Trade is the micro part of an international um, economics course. And there we're going to look more specifically at micro entities, meaning behavior of consumers, behavior of firms, and the interaction of those um, in a marketplace. We're going to begin by presenting a very simple model of just exchange. What is it that motivates individuals to come to a place and say, tell you what, I'll give you this if you give me that. What is it that motivates exchange and what are the impacts or effects that arise because of exchange? We're going to take that and we're going to build it up and talk about the theory of comparative advantage, something I'm sure you've heard about. You may have learned something about it before, but it's a concept that's rather subtle, somewhat difficult, and something which, even if you've learned it before, it may not have sunk in perfectly and it's worth going over again. So we'll talk about comparative advantage, what it means, what the implication is for international trade between countries. And we'll talk about different types of trade policies that countries implement and pursue. A lot of things related to things like the World Trade Organization and what it's about. Things like free trade agreements and things like trade remedy laws, like anti-dumping and anti-subsidy laws. You'll learn a little bit about the institutions that are out there, the way trade policy works in the United <laughs> States, the way trade agreements have been formed and why, and some of the theoretical understandings we have about why these things are there, what good they are, who they benefit, who they might hurt, and some of the issues related to that. A key policy issue, I would say, with respect to the first half of the course, finance, has a lot to do with uh, what is the appropriate exchange rate policy. Uh, should you have fixed exchange rates or should you have floating exchange rates? And what is the way in which we can, like what are the things we ought to focus our attention on in monitoring and measuring the macro economy 
and what kinds of things can we use to influence those outcomes. The second half of the course on trade, I would say the most important or critical policy issue is the issue of should we have free trade or should we have protectionism of some sort or to some degree. I like to call it selective protectionism because rarely does somebody claim and come out and say we ought to just close our borders down and, and not trade with anybody. But people do often say that we ought to protect certain markets or certain industries under certain circumstances or conditions, and I would call that a kind of selected protectionism. We're going to talk about the pros and cons of both freer trade and also the pros and cons of selected protectionism, and you'll have a much better sense of how to understand and maybe participate in that particular policy debate. I'm going to do things a little bit different, or at least the style I have, is that I think it's very important in both the trade and the finance section to get kind of a lay of the land kind of sense of what's going on in the international economy. Um, it's very typical for a lot of economics professors to just walk in and on the first day of class start teaching the theory and models of comparative advantage, for example. And from my perspective, I think, thinking about it, thinking about it from a student's perspective, it's hard to kind of wrap yourself around that and get a sense of why am I learning this, why is it important, why is this interesting, and why should I be um, uh, understanding it. So what I like to do is I like to kind of give an overview of what's going on. In this case today, we're going to talk about what's going on in the international economy today. And we're going to look at some of the measures we use at the macro level, in particular gross domestic product pr pr primarily. Um, and we're going to take the, and talk about the national income identity. We're going to look at it from the vantage point of the United States. We're going to look at what GDP looks like around the world. We're going to talk a little bit, I will, about what's been going on in the world economy in the recent past and in the longer past. And so I'm going to throw out a lot of just um, kind of statistical data information. And some of it I'm going to want you to remember. When I do want you to remember certain data or statistics, I will tell you. This is important. Remember it. Occasionally, I might forget to say that. So try to remember some of the things that are important. But I'm just throw, I'm, you're going to see so many numbers today, it'll be impossible to memorize all of them, of course. So um, learn to identify kind of what's, what's probably important to remember. What I want to do is to give you just a little bit of a sense of what's going on in the international economy. Now, the way in which we measure the success of an economy, you probably know it, is that we have this one statistic or variable, this one measure that we measure for all sorts of countries, we follow it, we track it, we see how fast it grows, and we seem to put almost undue importance on the value and its change over time. And that value or variable is the gross domestic product. Okay, now, the gross domestic product is defined as total value of all final goods and services produced within an economy during the course of a year. Total value of Final, uh, final goods and services produced within an economy during the course of a year. Now, it's the measure, if you will, of how much actual stuff an economy is producing during the year. And we could step back from that and say, well, why, first of all, should we even be concerned or care about how much is being produced in the whole economy? I mean, we might care what's being produced by ourselves or nearby, or but why should we care what's happening in the entire aggregate economy? Well, the answer, I think, lies a lot in terms of kind of what the central purpose of economics might be thought to be. I told my undergraduates today, I said, you know, what, what, what is the study of economics all about anyway? What are we really interested in trying to promote, understand? What are we trying to achieve in its study? And I would put it this way. We're trying to maximize people's happiness. Happiness is what we're after. Now, happiness accrues to people in a lot of different ways. One of the ways in which people derive some happiness, at least, though not all, is through the consumption of goods and services. How much you can consume, how well fed you are, how well clothed, what kind of car you drive, what kind of residence you live in, what kind of vacations you can afford to go on, whether you have health care or don't have health care, or how much of it, or what quality it is, whether you've got clean drinking water, whether you've got sanitary, uh, good sanitary conditions, all of these things are things that are regularly traded in markets, are produced by firms, 
and are measured in the gross domestic product. GDP measures the amount of stuff we're producing, which is then thereby consumed by households and governments and businesses, and generates some level of happiness or well-being as a result of the consumption of those individual items. So why do we care about GDP? Because it's the amount of stuff we're producing, and we think that stuff and more of it is going to generate more happiness to the groups of people who are living in a particular society. Now, we should recognize it's not measuring everything related to individual happiness, of course. We get happiness from a lot of other things besides just the consumption of goods and services, right? We get happiness from our friendships, from our families, from our pets, from all sorts of interactions and activities that we, that we undertake during the day or during the week or month. And consumption of goods and services, while related to a lot of those activities, is not the central source of the happiness in all cases. So economics is not trying to cover everything. It's just trying to focus on happiness that's derived from the consumption of goods and services. Now, I'm saying consumption of goods and services, and I mean that very specifically because I'm going to kind of talk about how we're not really measuring consumption of goods and services when we measure the gross domestic product. We're measuring the production of goods and services, how much is actually being produced within an economy during the course of the year. Now, in a closed economy, <coughs> that is one that's not open to international trade, what a country produces is exactly equal to what the country consumes. And so production is exactly what we want to care about. When we introduce international trade, which we will and do, uh, we're going to see that that is a little bit different from each other. And I'll get to those distinctions a little bit later. Now, there are lots of problems with using gross domestic product besides the ones that I've just mentioned. Uh, lots of problems related to using it as a measure of our well-being, our happiness, or more specifically, maybe our standard of living within a particular country. So one of the things I want you to be aware of are some of the criticisms or complaints about using GDP as a measure of well-being within a particular country. Any ideas? You've taken economics classes before, maybe you have it in your distant memories. What kind of things might we be um, missing because of our measure of gross domestic product? Yeah. Well, it adds to the information economy. How so? What do you mean? undervalues like internet services and the amount of information from the internet. Okay, so you're suggesting that maybe the market value, which is what we're measuring in GDP, is not quite capturing the total amount of happiness that might be accruing to people because of the use of information or because of technology. Okay, that's a valid concern. Yeah. Um, a larger GDP could indicate that we're producing more, so therefore that could produce more pollution. That could be harmful to the environment, which might ne not necessarily generate. Okay, happiness. production of goods and services might be creating economic bads, we might say, like pollution. And maybe the more we produce, the more pollution we're creating, the more unpleasant life is for some of us, the more dangerous it is in some ways. And so maybe there's not always a direct relationship between the two. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, it might lead one to suspect that a country with a high GDP a population that's happy when in fact it's a small country that just uses a lot of technology to produce a lot of the goods and services. So it might be just a, a misreading or you might say well, that country has a really happy population but it's just a small population. So thank you. Well, one thing to be concerned there, I'm not, I'm not quite sure I understand your point, but certainly one thing we have to care about is when we look at a national GDP, we don't have any idea off the top, how many people are using that production? How many people are consuming it? So there's one simple correction that we can and should make in making comparisons between individual countries, and that is to divide by the population so that we can get a per capita level of gross domestic product. And that's like saying, what if we took the amount that's being produced in the economy and we equally split it up amongst all of the individuals within that particular country? Then how much would each person's share be? And then by comparing that across individual countries, we can get a slightly better idea, maybe, of how well off people are in comparison to each other. Yeah? GDP per capita doesn't account for the distribution of wealth. And what do you mean by that? Very poor people might have nothing, and then um, 
all the wealth be congregated in one percent of the population. Okay, so no consideration in the measure in terms of distribution of income. Um, who's receiving the extra production that might be taking place? And this is especially concerning when we're talking about the growth of GDP, which is monitored very carefully. And when the growth number is big, everybody seems to be happy and all excited about it. Oh, the economy's doing well, growth is, is high. But what if the growth is generating more production, which is all being consumed by the very top, most wealthy people in the economy, while the poorer people in the economy are just getting more and more miserable and having less and less? You wouldn't be able to pick up that change in the distribution by just looking at the aggregate number or looking at GDP per person. So we're missing some important elements. Hold on, anybody here? Nobody has a hand. Yeah. Um, doesn't GDP account for the something with the people abroad owning production in the country counts as the GDP, doesn't it? Right. Um, we're going to draw a distinction a little bit later about the difference between gross national product and gross domestic product. These are two different ways of measuring our national output, and they make a distinction between whether production is taking place abroad by domestic nationals or whether foreigners are operating within the country. And so that's a distinction that might be important as well, and we're going to take a look at it a little later in the back end. No, it, doesn't, it also doesn't take into account resale, like maybe like two-year-old like homes or used cars or something like that. Okay, excellent. With time. And the distinction there is we're looking at a measure GDP of national income, it's sometimes called. Income is the stream of production or income that's being generated during the course of the year. What we might be more concerned about is wealth. Wealth is the stockpiling of goods and services that are there and continue to generate a stream of value, of utility or happiness to us, even after it's been used for a period of time in the marketplace. So for example, uh, a used car is a good example. If you drive a used car that that's, was not produced in this particular year, its value does not get counted towards GDP. It's not a measure of our income this year. But it's generating services to you as you drive around town and get from place to place. It's generating happiness. Now, it was measured during the year in which it was produced, so it does get counted somewhere. But you're not getting the services that are being provided from it in the year in which it continues to be used. And that's true of cars and refrigerators and dishwashers and any kind of durable good that lasts for a period of time and continues to generate utility even after a while. We're not getting or capturing any of that in GDP. We're missing some important things. Question. Yeah. Goods on the black market and take that into account. And I'm not worth if it. I'm not sure if it's worth noting, but like some services that don't go accounted for, like perhaps in like developing nations, if you're taking care of like extended uh, family members or like elderly, and here we have like a nursing home, and that would be something. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so two distinctions there. One is whether black market activity you know, illegal activity is getting taken account of or not. And to some degree, we try to take that into account. So I believe that the statistic makers, you know, they try to do some estimates of that and they try to incorporate it so that we're getting true measures of actual production. I don't know how well of a job there, you know, it's something in the shadows, of course, so you can't really measure it directly and therefore we might not be picking up all of that. The second point you made has to do with non-market activity. So there's a lot of value that's being created when people help out each other and do things for each other, which in one country might get done in a marketplace where you hire a helper to help you around the house and you pay them for their services and therefore it gets counted as part of GDP. But if you did that same housework yourself, it doesn't get counted as part of GDP. Same production, same usage, same happiness is being created, but you're not getting a measure of it because it's not in the market in some places. In the back. Uh, a country's debt could be more than its production. I'm sorry, it's... A country's debt could be more than its production. Uh, debt can factor in and certainly have some long-term consequences, and we're going to think very carefully about that and concern ourselves with it when we talk about trade deficits and what they mean for the long term. Uh, one or two more, yeah. Another thing is that it can be misleading because it can rise after a natural disaster. Okay, um, bad things can happen in an economy, and one of, the, one of the curious things that happens when economists are asked, so what's, what's going to happen in the economy as a result of the hurricane that's just devastated this area? 
And economists will generally say, well, surprisingly, uh, GDP is probably going to go up much faster as a result of that. And the reason is, is because a lot of activity will now take place in that area to rebuild the wealth that has just been destroyed by the hurricane. So if we were measuring wealth changes, the hurricane would show that there has been a big drop in wealth because we've lost some infrastructure, we've lost buildings, we've lost useful property that was available before that's not available now. When we measure income, though, income just kind of chugs along at a current pace. You have a disaster. Now everybody moves faster and tries to produce and recover that wealth. That raises GDP, giving us a misreading of kind of the well-being of the economy at that particular point. Okay. Um, so one last thing that wasn't mentioned along the way I'll point out is we also have to worry our, ourselves about um, price level changes, price changes. So for example, I take this bottle of water. Let's say this bottle of water costs $1. Let's suppose I produce 1 million of these bottles of water and sell them on the marketplace in the course of a year. My GDP from this bottle would be $1 million. Okay. Now, let's suppose I produce 1 million bottles next year, but I sell them for $1.25 instead. $1.25 times a million bottles, $1.25 million worth of GDP. My GDP has suddenly increased, but the real number of bottles that I'm producing is exactly the same one year to the next. So we'd like a way of taking into account the price changes that prevail for individual items so that we can keep track of the real production value of the goods and services that are being produced year by year. So we can do that with the bottles of water very easily. We just say, well, let's create a price index. The price index was 1 in year 1. It was 1.25 because of the 25% increase in prices um, in year 2. We take GDP in year two, 125, 1.25 million, divided by the index 1.25, and we get one, indicating that there was no change in the real value of goods produced from one year to the next. That simple exercise is what we do in a much more complicated fashion when we convert nominal GDP, the value that prevails in the year in which things were produced, to a real GDP. Converting them to dollars and prices as they prevailed in the year of the index. Currently, for most calculations, I think it's 2009. And so that's another adjustment that ought to be or could be made. We are, one of the things I want to look at is let's look at how GDP is distributed around the world a little bit, just to get a sense of, uh, to get our bearings a little bit on GDP. And I want you to know and learn some of these numbers. So I'm going to take a look at the list of GDP by the nominal terms. And Wiki is nice because they give um, the latest data that's been made available by several different sources of information. The IMF, International Monetary Fund, on the left, the World Bank in the middle, the United Nations on the right. And one thing to note is that the numbers or values are all a little bit different. Now, one reason for the difference is going to be the year that's being presented is a little bit different. So 2016, 2015, 2014 for the three different organizations. They also will use slightly different methods, get their data from slightly different sources. And so it's very typical, even if you're looking at the same year in the same country, if you're drawing data from separate sources, they may not match perfectly. And the fact that they don't match should be an indication to you and all of us that things are not measured with a high degree of precision all the time. Mistakes are made, and not only that, it's very difficult to think even about the exercise of how do we add up the value of all the goods produced in a whole country during the course of a whole year. It's not easy to do. And so they do the best they can. They use different methods sometimes, and we come up with slightly different numbers. Now, let's start with the number at the top here. Let's look at IMF, because it's the latest data. It's es actually, it's not even the latest data. It's estimates for 2016, which means these aren't actually even the real values. These are the values that the IMF has projected will prevail by the end of this year, which has not yet happened. Maybe we should go to the World Bank numbers. Yeah, let's go to the World Bank numbers then. Forget the IMF. Okay, so world gross domestic product. First of all, this is in millions of dollars, and we're reporting that world GDP in 2015 last year, was 73 million million dollars. A million million is a trillion. 
So $73 trillion worth of production of goods and services worldwide. That's actually worth knowing. Just to have your bearings for future references, for future numbers that might come your way, I'd like you to have some idea that GDP is around, and I'll never ask you for the exact number. I will only ever ask you for an approximate value. And if you say $75 trillion is world GDP, you got it right. If you say $80 trillion, you got it right. If you say $70 trillion, you got it right. Anything in the neighborhood is going to be okay for an approximate value. If you say $3 billion, you're way off. You're not going to get that right. So get the measure, the units correct, get the scale correct, and start to learn about how these numbers look in terms of their size. So $75 or so trillion dollars. Now, the United States, let's focus on there since we're sitting in that country right now. Uh, the U.S. is approximately, as of 2015, about $18 trillion, 17.9 there, but $18 trillion, or 18 million millions. I think you should know that number, approximately. 18 is okay, 19 is okay, 20 is okay, 15 is probably okay, 10 is like half of that, so it's really not quite okay. And it's got to be trillions. So $18 trillion is U.S. GDP. Now, some other countries. The EU, which is a collection of what? Like 29 countries now are in the EU? Is that right? So 29 countries in the EU and Europe. And they make up um, about 18.4, 18.5 trillion. So a little bit more than U.S. production is the European Union in total, according to this data. China is listed here as $10 trillion. Uh, so not a little bit more than half of what the United States is and Japan at $4 trillion and so forth. And if you go down the list, you can see all of the countries that lie, let's say, above the $1 trillion mark. Uh, Mexico doing the, break, uh, the breaking point there, uh, the last country that's just above $1 trillion of GDP. All right, but there's a lot of countries in the world, right? I won't ask you to memorize these. A lot of countries, a lot of different values. And very quickly, you can get down into the midst of this and go, okay, Bolivia, $33 billion of um, gross domestic product. Is that a lot? Is that not a lot? You can't really answer or compare much at all between countries unless um, you look at it per person, unless you see how much they're producing per person. So we're going to look at that in a minute. But before I do that, I actually would like to take a look at this chart over here that they provide. Because this chart is actually going to give us first real strong indication of the disparities in income that prevail around the, uh, around the world today. So the United States is in the green there. The entire circle represents the $73 trillion worth of GDP. The United States, if you had to estimate how, what fraction of the total is the U.S. production, what would you say? About a quarter. About a quarter, right? Might be a little bit less than that, but it's around a quarter. 25% of all production of goods and services in the world is produced in the United States. Now, what's more remarkable about that is that the population of the United States is a mere 320 million people. Or so. The world has a population of about about seven billion people. So just. 320 million people are producing one quarter of all of the total output of goods and services produced within the world. That's a lot. The EU. But how many people are in the EU? Any idea? It's about 450 million, give or take. A little bit bigger than the United States. But they're producing how much? Like about another quarter, maybe a little bit less. Another quarter or so of GDP. If you took U.S., EU, and Japan and put them together, we are almost certainly greater than 50% of the gross domestic product in the world is being produced by three regions. In total, they have less than a billion people. And that means the six billion other people in the rest of the world are producing the other half and sharing it amongst themselves, presumably. That means there are some very wide disparities of income across countries within, within the world. Let's see how much. We can see this better by looking at per capita values. Uh, so let me go back a page. No, not that one. Yeah. Now we're going to look at nominal GDP per capita. 
So this just means divided by the population of the individual countries, and let's take a look at the, at the rankings. Uh, again, issued by the World <coughs> Bank in the middle here for 2015. Actually, we can use IMF because they have actual data from 2015 too. Doesn't matter which one. Let's use the first column. It's easier. Okay, divided by the population now, we've got the country with the highest GDP per person is Luxembourg at $101,000 per person. Now, Luxembourg is a very small country. In fact, it's more like a county in the United States. Um, I don't think it has more than like 30,000 people or something like that. And, um, but it's got a very high um, um, GDP per person. Switzerland is next at 80,000. Uh, Qatar is at 76,000. Norway at 74. One thing that's notable about um, the three countries there, um, actually, uh, Qatar and Norway in particular, is they produce a lot of energy. Uh, a lot of oil and gas production by both Norway and Qatar puts them very high on the list in terms of GDP per person. The United States comes up fifth in this ranking at $55,000 per person. That's a number you should remember. US GDP per person is about $55,000. Again, another reason for remembering some values like this is for reference. Later on, you're going to be looking at you know, what's going on in, in Asian countries, and you're going to see GDPs per person, and you need to have some reference to something <coughs> that you can say, is this a lot, is this a little, how does it compare? If you don't have in your memory some values for perspective, it's very hard to get that perspective and know what you should make of things. Yeah? That's a question. Does Qatar account for guest workers? This is GDP, and so any kind of production that takes place internally, even by guest workers, is going to get counted as part of GDP, yes. All right. Monaco, look at over here. United Nations says Monaco has $187,000 per person, and Liechtenstein is $157,000. Now, those are a little bit misleading, if only because, like I said, these are countries, if you will, that are about the size of counties in the United States. So if you took a circle and put it around a small region of the United States, where a lot of wealthy people live, for example, you would find that its per capita income is very, very high. But can you, can you exploit that? Can you get that across a country of 320 million people? Eh, that's a little bit harder to do. All right, there's another value I want you to look at here. And first of all, just kind of note how quickly it drops off, how you get into the mid-40s and low-40s when you're even in a country like Canada. Canada at 43,000 compared to the U.S. at 55,000. Average production, then, is quite a bit lower. That's a significant drop in total production per person. In a country, Canada, right, our neighbor, that, to me, looks just like the United States in, in most respects. It doesn't look like they would be poorer as measured by this particular value. You go to other countries like Italy or South Korea, the numbers fall back. <coughs> one number I'd like you to know, perhaps, is this one, the world. Because that'll give some perspective as well. Average GDP per person in the world is about $10,000. That makes GDP in the United States per person over five times higher than the average and starts to get at the very large disparities of income production that are taking place in countries around the world. A couple of other countries that I think are worth looking at for comparison is, uh, first of all, Brazil is here at $8,600, just in the Olympics there. That's less than the world average. So Brazil would be a poorer than average country, according to this measure. So China comes in at level uh, ranking 72, and it's at about $8,000 per person. Now that means five, six, seven. Eight times seven gets you to the U.S. <laughs> so it's seven times less on average per person than production in the United States. India is another good country to take a look at, another large country with over a billion people. India comes in at $140, $1,600 only per person compared to the developed countries where it's greater than thirty dollars or $40,000 per person. Great disparities. And then, just look at all of these countries that are down there, many of them with very large populations, and we're looking at GDPs per person that are less than $1,000 per person. The degree of poor versus rich is very notable when you look at just income. This is just production that takes place within a year, true but it's showing you great disparities of income across countries within the world.
Now, there's one thing that we might want to concern ourselves with, though. And that is, one thing you may have noted if you've traveled in developing countries in the world, or any other country, really, is that you may have noticed that the prices of standard goods that you might buy can differ quite um, enormously. Um, so you could go to one country and purchase a meal at a restaurant, and you might find at the current exchange rate that things are really, really cheap. It seems like, gosh, I could buy lots of restaurant meals here. I could eat really well. My money goes a long way. You might go to another country. Switzerland's a good example of that. Uh, and you might find, oh my gosh, everything costs so much. I couldn't afford to live here for very long at all. Prices of everything just seem really, really high. So what about that? If we're comparing GDPs per person across countries and we recognize that there are very large disparities in the prices of individual goods that the people there are buying and able to buy, then okay, Switzerland has a high GDP per person, but if it costs you five times more to buy everything, are you really able to get a higher standard of living? But we'd like to be able to take account of those price disparities across countries, and we can do that with some level of error or with some estimation. So purchasing power parity is a theory we're going to talk about later on in the course in a few weeks or so. Uh, and we're going to highlight this uh, notion a little bit more carefully later on. But in a nutshell, it just means, what if we could use an exchange rate between countries that better reflects the purchasing power of a unit of currency in the two countries? What if we could equalize the prices, so to speak? which are not equalized when we use the current exchange rate comparisons, which is what we are doing with so-called nominal GDP comparisons between countries. So we use a different exchange rate, a constructive exchange rate, to do PPP, purchasing power parity. But it is a much better way of making international comparisons of GDP across countries. So let's take a look at GDP per person, per capita again, and look at what the numbers look like in the world. Now, for the United States, GDP per person in PPP terms is 55,000 or so, about the same number as before. And it should be, because we're not converting dollars for the unit of, of measurement, which is the dollar. So the dollar should stay the same. But if a value in this list, PPP terms, goes up in going from nominal to PPP, then it means that goods and services are relatively cheaper in that country. And so the number goes up to reflect the fact that their money goes further. It buys them a higher standard of living, so to speak. And we're going to compensate and take account of that with this PPP measure. So if the value goes up, prices are lower in that country compared to the US. If the value goes down in moving from nominal to PPP, then prices are um, more expensive in that other country compared to the US. So we take a look at like Switzerland at $58,000 here per person now in PPP terms. If we go back to nominal real quick, Switzerland was $80,000 per person. So in shifting between the two, Switzerland's value fell precipitously, fell a lot. And uh, that means, as indeed they are, things cost a lot in Switzerland compared to the United States. Okay, we've got some other countries on the list here, though, at the top. Um, Qatar went up, actually, to $132,000 per person. Luxembourg fell just a little bit, so it's a little bit pricey to live in Luxembourg. Singapore is up there, Brunei, Kuwait, Norway, all higher than the U.S. now, and the United States is still there at 10th in terms of GDP per person in PPP terms. Let's take a look at the world. Where's the world here? There between 75 and 76 in the ranking. World GDP has now risen up to $15,000 per person in PPP terms. And that's a reflection of the fact that on average, we're kind of misrepresenting how far currency and money will go in different countries, and we're not adequately measuring the standards of living that's achievable in especially poorer countries where the prices of primary goods and many goods that people buy are much lower than they are in expensive countries in the developed world. So when we take the average with PPP, we get a much higher GDP per person at fifteen, sixteen thousand dollars $16,000 per person. So remember that. In GDP in nominal terms per person is about $10,000. 
GDP in the world on average in PPP terms is about fifteen or sixteen thousand dollars per person. Look at Brazil. Brazil went from below average before to just about average. <coughs> Brazil looks wealthier or richer in this measure than they did before. Where's China? I miss it? There, 84. Now it's at $14,000 per person. What was it before? Uh, eight, seven, right? Seven, eight. 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 So about $8,000, it's gone up to $14,000. So it's much closer to the average, just a little bit below the average now. Um, and it indicates that China is looking um, a little bit better per person than it was before. It's still significantly below the United States and other developed countries, but it looks, um, it looks healthier in, in this respect. India, where is it? There, 122. India is up from $1,600 to $6,100, a little over $6,000 per person. Also, reflecting the fact that prices of goods and services in India are decidedly lower on average than they would be in developed countries like the United States and in Europe. Um, and that reflects that. We go down further and see GDPs per person across the world. We only have now four countries um, that are below $1,000 in per capita GDP. But there are still a lot of countries in the 1,000, 2,000 range, and we're still seeing a very vast disparities of incomes that exist on average uh, between peoples across the world, as measured by this admittedly flawed measure of production and well-being. But it's like the best one we got out there, and it is the one that is most commonly used to make comparisons and to draw understandings about how well a country or an economy is doing. Okay, one last thing I want to show you here before I move on to some particulars. If I look at GDP per person in PPP terms, here's where we can get something rather interesting and provocative, perhaps. The IMF this past year announced, and they're projecting for 2016, that China is going to have a larger GDP than the United States. China is bigger than the U.S. in total production terms. Not measured at current exchange rates, but when measured using the <coughs> received or contrived uh, purchasing power parity exchange rate, which is a better reflection of the actual real value of goods and services being produced in that economy. So now we rank U China as the largest economy in the world, and that's measured in this particular way. It's giving us that indication. China is larger than the EU and the United States, um, is, and it is on a par in terms of their total productiveness. But again, China still has a great disadvantage relative to the developed world because they've got 1.3 billion people to spread out the GDP across, and that's leading, as we saw, to just $14,000 of production per person being produced by the Chinese economy to date. So still a far cry away from the productive <coughs> productivity levels that exist um, in the developed countries around the world. Okay, any questions on any of this? Yes. Just to <coughs> further clarify what this uh, ranking is, it's that's their real GDP used in the currency of the purchasing power of currency. Yeah, it's using, so think of, so what we're doing is we're converting with a different exchange rate. And the exchange rate that's being created is one that's equalizing the purchasing power of currency in the two countries. So it's kind of like equalizing the prices, if you will. Uh, just to clarify again, uh, so China being number one here means that people in China can afford to purchase more goods. Well, no. It means China is producing more goods overall uh, in real kind of in real terms than the U.S. is by itself or than the EU is by itself. So it's the largest producer in the world when we measure it in this particular way. Okay, but when we are uh, talking about PPP per capita, that is a measure of how much... That's taking this 20 trillion and dividing it now by 1.3 billion. <laughs> that gives us the $14,000 per person. So that is the purchasing power. So the higher up, like Qatar, would be more expensive in comparison with China. Um, they're both producing a lot more per person. 
not in aggregate terms, mm -hmm. because it's a much smaller country, mm -hmm. but they're producing more per person. And I forgot which way the uh, Qatar Qatar went. was number one, and China was producing around 10,000 uh, 10, or 14,000 per person. Per, per person. Okay, yeah. right. But did Qatar's go up or down in moving from nominal to GDP? Um, um, Qatar was a number, like... But not the ranking, the value. Okay, so let's look. So GDP per capita in nominal terms, Qatar was at $76,000. And when we do it in PPP terms... 76 to 132. So um, the number went way up for Qatar. That meant, oh gosh, that means that Qatar prices are really, really low in comparison to what they would be in the United States. I, I, I don't know why it's like that. I've never, I've not been to Qatar, so I don't know why. It does is, have you been there? Is it cheap? No, I have never been. There. Okay. <laughs> so, so go to Qatar. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> and, but bring, I don't know, bring a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the higher up you are in this ranking, that means the lower your, lower your prices. Well, um, no, I'm, that's that's not quite right. In moving from nominal to to to, um, to PPP uh -huh. for a particular country, if it goes up, okay, then your prices are lower than in the United States. Okay. So we can't look at the ranking across countries in this list to get some judgment about price comparison. Okay. And in fact, in this list for PPP, we have equalized, in essence, the prices across all of the countries. So they should all be equal. And then the GDPs per person are given, having taken account of it. Okay, and also PPP is calculated using, uh, calculated using the real GDP, right? Uh, not quite. And we'll come back and we'll talk about how we do that later. Real quickly, we're going to talk a little bit later about the distinction between the next class, actually, the distinction between GDP and GNP. So GDP, which is what we're measuring here, is measuring all of the physical production that's taking place within the country, regardless of the source of the producers, the workforce, where they're from, and it's kind of taking into account, I think, the remittances and flows of money that are flowing back and forth. But what gets produced within the country per person is what's being measured. I guess one of the critical issues is, is are we dividing by the local population? Are we dividing by the local population plus the guest workers? And quite honestly, I'm not sure. But those are the kinds of questions then you have to delve into and find answers to, to, to get a closer to true comparison between countries. And sometimes issues like that are very important. OK, now. Gross domestic product is important, and it's not just important in its total size and its distribution around the country, around the world, uh, but it's also important in terms of its composition. So, what is in front of you? Let me see. GDP, gross domestic product on the left-hand side, is equal to the summation of consumption plus investment plus government plus exports of goods and services minus imports of goods and services from the rest of the world. You've seen this before, no doubt. It's called the national income identity. And what it's doing is basically breaking up gross domestic product into important subcomponents so that we can kind of understand within a country how is the production of goods and services being distributed amongst different players or actors. In particular, how much is going to households in terms of the consumption of households for day-to-day -day living expenses and whatnot. That's the consumption term right here, C. Consumption expenditures by households and what component of GDP is going to that consumption term. Investment. Investment is the amount of produced goods which are not being purchased by households and consumed and used up, but rather is going into the production process of a company and is being used to produce goods and services in the future. Now, investment here is not financial investment. So a lot of times we use the term investment and we say, oh, I'm investing my money in the stock market, I've got a 401k plan, and those are my investments. Yes, those are investments, but they're financial investments and it's not what we're measuring here. Here we're talking about physical investment, if you will. Things like plant and equipment and computers that are purchased by firms to help them do the business of producing the goods and services that they're producing for the community. All right? So 
It's what's taken out of consumption, is not being used today so that we have the stuff we need in order to produce tomorrow's goods and services. That's investment. G, government. The government term here measures government expenditures, again, on goods and services. So only government production or goods that the government is actually directly producing for us, like in the programs that the government runs, the workers that we hire, the military, um, and the salaries of, um, of soldiers, all of that is getting counted as part of G. The other distinction to make here is that when we measure G in this national income account, we're not measuring just the federal government spending. We're also measuring all the states and all the communities and all the cities. Everything is jumbled in together in that G. And so the data you see for here might differ from other data you might have seen because a lot of times people are presenting like what the government federal budget looks like, what the federal government is spending, what the federal deficit looks like. And here we're looking at the overall government um, across all sectors in the economy. Second distinction that's worth noting about G is that it does not include transfer payments that the government makes. So if the government brings in money in the form of Social Security taxes, as it does from all of our paychecks, and then takes that money and redisperses it to retired individuals or disabled individuals within the economy, as it does, the money that the government expends on those programs is not counted as part of G. G is purchases of goods and services, not a transfer from one individual to another individual, which is what's happening with Social Security, with welfare payments, with unemployment compensation, and with other things of that sort. Exports and imports. That's where the trade part comes in. We're going to focus a lot of attention starting next class especially on the export and import term and um, how it plays a role in this particular identity. Now, it can be useful to know a little bit of the breakdown of GDP for a representative country. And again, uh, we'll become US-centric here and focus our attention on the US since we're here. Okay, from a link in the supplementary readings of the text uh, in the syllabus, um, you can get your hands on this indicator of gross domestic product and its breakdown for the United States. Um, and it's, um, I've got it listed here in 2014 and 2015, but if you go here and swing to the left, uh, you'll see it goes back. And it goes back to the 80s and the 70s and the 60s and the 50s, all the way to the beginning of the data stream, which is 1929. Uh, right at the start of the Great Depression. And I point out that we've got values for gross domestic product and its components all listed here. Uh, but we didn't actually collect this data in 1929 and 1930. There was no national accounts that were being collected. It really only developed uh, during about the World War II period and into the 1950s. And only then did the US and other developed countries start to collect this data, aggregate it across the entire economy, and come up with a measure that was reported every year and every quarter called the gross domestic product. So these are relatively new constructions. And the data from before has actually been constructed and, and estimated based on information and data that we have. Now, all of these terms are in nominal. So these are all year-by-year -year values that have not been um, converted to real values, meaning um, these are the values as they prevailed in the year in question. And that means they all relate to the prices of goods as they prevailed in the year in question. That's what nominal gross domestic product refers to. Now, here again, gross domestic product in the United States in 2015, the last full year that we have data for, um, amounted to just short of $18 trillion. So if you're going to remember a number for the U.S., remember... Uh, GDP in total is $18 trillion. So, you know, you might in five years see that GDP in the U.S. is you know, $25 trillion. And you'll say, I remember back then I took this into my class when it was just $18 trillion. What about inflation and real numbers? Those numbers are calculated and presented. I'm not giving them to you here. But when we calculate, for example, the growth of GDP, and that gets reported on a quarterly basis, and we focus our attention very carefully on whether it's growing or not, or is the country doing well or not, 
Those are measures of real gross domestic product changes. So they've taken into account the price level changes, they've adjusted for them, equalized the prices across years, and then calculated growth rates so that we're getting a better, a more accurate measure of what's actually happening in the economy. Okay, for our purposes here though, what I want to do is look at the breakdown across different groups. And there it doesn't matter really whether we're looking at real or nominal, because they're going to be very similar in a year. Now, $18 trillion, how is it broken up? Line number two refers to personal consumption expenditures. That's the C in our national income identity. Notice that it was $12.2 trillion. You don't have to remember that number. That's too hard to remember. It's broken down, and by the way, the way this, this chart works is personal consumption expenditures is not indented. Goods is indented at a certain level, and so is services. So the goods number and the services number in line three and six are going to add up to the one above that's not indented to the same degree. So goods plus services here is going to add up to personal consumption expenditures. Or in other words, 39.78 over here, there, plus, where is it, 82.93 is going to add up to the 12.271. All right, so they got, they've got a little bit of redundancy here in the numbers. Uh, likewise, durable goods plus non-durable goods adds up to total goods. And so we get a little bit of the breakdown, and if you care, you can find even more uh, finer breakdowns of data that's presented by the Bureau of Economic Analysis, which is where this comes from. Okay, gross private domestic investment at $3 trillion. Uh, that's the I term in the national income identity. Go down here to... Cons Government, 22, that's government consumption expenditures and gross investment. That's at $3.1 trillion, the values for this break. I want you to see them one time through at least. Uh, look here at the federal versus state and local. The federal is just $1.2 trillion versus state and local, which is almost twice the size at $1.9 trillion. So there's more spending on goods and services by the state and local governments in the U.S. than there is by the federal government. That's reversed when we talk about transfer payments by federal versus state and local. There's much, much more transfer payments being made by the federal government in the U.S. than there is by the state and locals. Also take a look at national defense versus non-defense, which is an important uh, breakdown. Of the $1.2 trillion of spending by the federal government, fully, uh, like almost three-fourths of it is national defense um, listed there, and only 483 is non-defense. Now, the last two terms in our identity is exports and imports. So exports is listed here at $2.2 trillion. And imports are listed here as $2.7 trillion. So if you do that, 12.2 plus 3, $3 trillion plus 3.1 plus 2.2 minus 2.7, and you get $17.9 trillion. You get the breakdown. Right, now, a better way to remember these numbers, if you're going to remember anything, is this breakdown right here. These are percentages. These are looking at consumption as a percentage of the gross domestic product within that particular year. It's looking at investment as a percentage. And these are giving you a better idea of how the GDP <coughs> is broken up into the different areas of interest within the economy. Now, it's notable that gross domestic product, that consumption as a share of GDP is about 70% in the United States. The U.S. is often claimed to be a consumption economy, consumption-based economy. And one data you can use to identify or to indicate that is that 70% is actually a pretty high number as a percentage of total production. So an awful lot of the goods and services being produced in this country are actually going to households. They're consuming them, using them up today. As a result of that very high consumption rate, in part, we have a much lower investment rate than many people view as desirable. Our investment is at 16.8% of GDP, you can see there, 17% or so. It's worth knowing that it's in the <coughs> mid-teens. It's worth knowing that consumption is about 70% of GDP in the U.S. Now, investment is at 16.8%, and you might say, well, how does that compare over time? So one thing you can do on this table is actually scroll to the left. 
So it's at 16.8 now. What was it, I don't know, 10 years ago or so? Um, a little bit more than 10 years. It was at 19.5% of GDP, a little bit higher. Go back a few more years, 20.3% in 1984, randomly picking out years. Go back a little bit earlier, 15.2% eh, in 1975. That was a recession year. Go back a little bit earlier to the 1950s, we're at 17%, 14 15%. Hmm. Okay. Investment is in the teens. Go back and look at economic analyses and commentary and opinion about investment relative, uh, percentages in the U.S. To a T, you'll see people complain, it's too low, it's too low, it's too low. The U.S. should have higher investment, should invest more for the future, it would help it grow faster, it would help raise the standard of living. This has been a standard complaint, and that's where in the data you can look to see a little bit of that phenomenon. Professor? Yes? What's the desirable percentage then? Well, it depends on who you're talking to. And we'll see that for some countries, and we're going to look at China as an example in a little bit, we're going to see that these numbers are two and a half times higher than they are in the United States. Um, in Asia and economies in general, the investment rates are very, very high and have been for the last 30 or 40 years or more. In Europe, the numbers tend to be in the mid 20 sometimes, or in the low 20%. So the U.S. has had a relatively low investment rate compared to an awful lot of other countries. And yet, the U.S. continues to be the largest economy in the world, uh, by some measures, continues to produce a very high standard of living for its people, despite having what many observers have claimed is a too low of an investment rate. So part of what I'm throwing out here is not really an analysis of, is that a co correct comment or not, but rather just this is what people have said. So you get a sense of what people are concerned about, what they look at, what they say when they see this kind of data, what ranges are viewed as too low, what's viewed as being high, so that you get a little bit of a sense of that by looking at these numbers. Yeah? Is there like an explanation for why economic or economists argue that we've done so well even though our investment percentages are not desirable? Well, investment is how many um, kind of goods and services we're tucking away to help produce other goods and services. And that is one thing that will affect our growth rate, without a doubt. Mm -hmm. Another thing that affects our growth rate, though, is innovation. So coming up with new ideas, leveraging the production and investment that we have already, and making values rise even faster, despite the fact that the amount we're, we're plugging into it is low. Another reason might be your suggestion earlier, which is that you know, maybe we're measuring it improperly in some way. So we're not able, you know, investment is not the perfect measure to kind of indicate the growth success of a country because it's missing some of the information and technology um, that's allowing us to grow a lot faster. So there are some things like that that might contribute to the discrepancy. Yeah. Uh, are there ever any measurements where the consumption by Americans abroad is included either in the domestic, our, consumption or is that within maybe foreign uh, I don't know offhand. Consumption by Americans abroad, whether we would include it somewhere, I don't know if we have a measure. I'm not sure if it would be that significant. I don't think we have that many U.S. nationals living abroad. But having not seen the number, um, I, don't I don't know. Yeah? Um, I'm going off of what she said. Uh, does it have anything to do with what you're producing? Like, um, for example, China produces usually labor-intensive small items, but consum small consumer items, whereas U.S. produces different, like, large things. Yeah, I mean, it could have a lot to do with measurement of um, manufacturing goods, which are somewhat easier to measure than it is services values, mm -hmm. and whether we're accurately measuring services values or not. So there could be some discrepancy there that it, that we're missing in some ways. Yeah, that's what. Is it also possible that infrastructure would already having the infrastructure in place would lower the amount of investment you needed to make? Sure. I mean, if you put a lot of it, but then that would say you should go back a few years and see high investments kind of creating this infrastructure. Now it's tapering off because we've got the infrastructure we need and we don't yet need to do sub substantial repairs on it or something of that sort. We really don't see that too much in the series of uh, data for the U.S. Now let's go on and look at a couple of other factors here. One thing that's interesting is to look at G as a percentage of GDP, and this would be one way of measuring the size of government, which is something that a lot of people focus attention on and are concerned about. 
you know, you'll hear some conversations in the policy world about you know, government is too big, government is growing rapidly, it's taking over more and more of a share of the economy. Others are saying, no, 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 we need to do more. <coughs> government has to be involved more. We should be increasing spending. We should be. So you've got a lot of conflict of opinion as to what is the appropriate size of government in the U.S. and in other countries around the world. One way to measure government size, and this is only one of many, is to look at the size of G as a percentage of GDP. So the number for 2015 is 17.7%. All right, so 17.7% of the total goods that are produced in the economy during the year gets <laughs> bought up and used, consumed by the government, the government sector. All right, is that a big number or a small number? Well, one thing we can do is look at its change in the recent past and note that it's tapered and it's fallen down from the 21% range in 2009 down to 17% today. So using this measure, if you wanted to, you could claim government is actually growing, I mean, I'm sorry, is actually diminishing, falling in its size or its capacity or its role in the, in the U.S. economy. If we go back a few years later, we can see that government in the 90s was at 18.9%, very comparable to what it is today. No significant change in the total size of government as a percentage of GDP. Go back to the 70s, and where are we? 22.7, 22, a little bit bigger in some years than it is today, measured this way. Go back a little bit longer into the 60s, and we're in also the mid-20% range. So measured this way, government has actually fallen, diminished in importance in some ways, in, at least in terms of the goods and services that are coming out of the gross domestic product. What we are not measuring with this government term, though, is transfer payments. And that is the component of government which has grown during the last 30 to 50 or more years and has taken up a larger share of the economy. So, you know, one thing you can do is to say, okay, government is only, oops, I didn't want to do that. Uh, government is only 17 point something percent of the economy. And you might have heard some data that looks a little bit different. If I go down, there's some other data that's presented here, and I'll just uh, refer to it pretty quickly. Uh, we can go to uh, different measurements of the size of government in the economy. And so here's a measure that we might use, which is just federal expenditures as a percentage of GDP. And that federal expenditures is going to include both um, consumption of goods and services, but also transfer payments. And note that it amounts to 22.4%, just the federal. The state and local expenditures in total is 13.7. If we add those together, we're actually at a total kind of contributory, you know, what government money that's going into and out of government, if you will, including transfers, is as much as 33.2% of the economy. If you want to emphasize the size of government, then you might, you might prefer to use this number. 33 sounds a lot bigger than 17%. And you have to be aware, and one of the points I want to make in talking about this data today, is to make you aware that there are lots of different ways of conveying similar ideas using different streams of data. And you could give an impression in one direction by using one stream of data that might be reasonable, and you can present another perspective by presenting another stream of data that would also, in some sense, be reasonable. And we have to be, as users or evaluators of data, we have to start to recognize measurement differences exist, different people present different data in different ways to make different points, and a lot of times it gets very confusing because this person says government is growing horrendously and here's some data to back it up. And you look at it and it says, oh yeah, it looks like that. But then somebody else says, no, government's not growing at all. In fact, it's diminishing inside. I could look at that 17% and show it falling over the last four years or six years and say, see, government's getting smaller. Both statements are right, but both statements are looking at different streams of data that's capturing different components or elements of government. And this is an important element of data analysis and understanding and interpretation of data. I'll give you a quick example that's uh, one that I, that's prominent out there in the public policy sphere. You've heard, for example, that average wages of uh, workers in the economy has been stagnant since the 1970s. Hasn't changed at all. Uh, average wages of workers in the economy have stayed the same. So working class Americans not, making, not getting any wealthier, average wages are staying exactly the same. 
Okay, well, but there's been a big change over in how firms provide compensation to employees. Wages are one form of compensation, but employers often provide retirement benefits to individuals. They contribute to their 401k. Firms provide um, health care uh, and will pay some components, sometimes fully, will pay for the health care of an individual. That's helping the individual and it's like a payment to the individual, but it doesn't get counted in wages. So if you measure something else, what's called total compensation, that adds up all the contributions by the firms that are being made on the, on the behalf of an individual, and we use that as the measure of well-being of the worker, well, then we see that the values rise since the 1970s on average across the economy. Measure different things, you get different conclusions about whether things are happening in a good way or a bad way. And you just, I'll, I'll keep emphasizing this point as we look at different types of data, because I want you to walk away with the lesson that you gotta be careful what you're looking at and you've gotta learn what the right things to look at are, what, what are better things and what are worse things, really. Because that's gonna help you evaluate and understand economic data a little bit better. So back to the breakdown of GDP in percentage terms. So GDP, uh, G is a percentage of GDP is 17.7. Let's look at exports and imports, and you'll see that exports are 12.6% of GDP, imports are about 15% of GDP. So that's measuring the amount of inflows and outflows of goods and services between the U.S. and the rest of the world in total. And we might ask, well, are those big numbers or small numbers in comparison to other countries? And the answer is, uh, it's kind of moderate, it's kind of in the middle, if you will. Some countries, like I've seen the numbers from Malaysia, for example, and was kind of astounded to see that exports as a percentage of GDP in Malaysia is like 75% of GDP, and imports are like 70% of GDP. I mean, they, it's a kind of an assembly economy where lots of intermediate inputs come into the country, they assemble lots of products, then they ship out the products to other countries around the world, they make income on the processing part of the production process, but you've got loads of imports coming in, loads of exports going out, and there's been a lot of economies that are functioning in that particular way. We look at the United States at 15% to 12%. Sometimes we add those numbers up and say the importance of trade is about 25, 27% of GDP, is how important trade is to the U.S. economy. And in comparison, that's not a very high number. And in fact, some have often used and looked at the U.S. and said, we're not a very open economy in some ways. The U.S. is kind of closed because we don't trade all that much with the rest of the world. Now, that's measured in terms of percentage of GDP. And one of the reasons we don't trade so much in that sense is because the U.S. is a very um, large and diverse economy with many natural resources available internally. It's a large in terms of geographic area. It's large in terms of its natural resource capacity and capabilities. It's, you know, it's productive in terms of its population and skill level of its population. And so therefore, the U.S. can actually and does produce an awful lot of the goods and services it needs internally within the country. It doesn't need to produce or trade as much as a very small country does for, for, for reasons like that. The other thing I want to point out is to look at trade as a percentage of GDP as we go back through the years. So let's go back 20 years or so. Uh, and we've got trade at, look, 10.7 and 11.9% is exports and imports. So we've dropped off about five percentage points on each term, right? Go back a few more years before that, another 20 years or 15, 20 years. And we're at nine and 7% much, much smaller component of trade back 30, 40 years ago. Go back even further. And you'll note it falls in the 60s to just 5 and 4%. Very closed economy in some sense back in the 1960s. We didn't trade that much. International trade, globalization, it was just not as big a phenomenon going back to um, the early post-World War II period in the United States. And go back even further still into the 50s, it's down to the 4%. And I want to show you a couple of also interesting things that arise in uh, the, the Depression years and in the post-Depression years. So let's go back to 1929, the first bit of data that we have here, and note that consumption then was 74% of GDP, so a little bit higher as a percentage of GDP. 
is consumption. Investment was a similar range, about 15%. But look at government as a share of the economy back in 1929. This is before the New Deal, uh, before the growth of government that kind of came with the New Deal era of the 30s and the post-World War II uh, kind of boom in government that took place. So government was only 9.1% of the total economy at that time. And exports and imports at the 5% range, we were not trading all that much. Notice how trade falls off from that 1929 level in the 1930s. This is the era of the Great Depression. Gross domestic product <coughs> fell precipitously in uh, the early years of the 1930s, from about 1930 to 1934. Uh, it then grow, grew very rapidly from 34 to 36 or so, and then fell again uh, very rapidly in 1937. Uh, so we had kind of a two dips in the Great Depression years. There's a description of that in the, in the readings. And kind of take note of that, because you're being presented in the notes with a description of different changes in growth rates of GDP in different recessionary and depression periods. And kind of having some sense of what's really bad and what's not so bad is useful to have as well. I'll come back and I'll look at that just a minute, uh, a little bit more in just a minute. Now, the last thing that's kind of interesting to look at here is, first of all, uh, look at what's happened to investment. 16% of the economy in 1929, this is before the Depression hit, looks how it falls down to 3% of GDP in 1932. So business activity fell dramatically, growth in the economy dropped. Notice how consumption goes up to 82%. That's reflective of what you might call a starving economy. Everybody is producing and spending all of their necessities. There's not much extra to go around anywhere else. And notice also that the size of government was only, well, it grew from 9 up to 15%. So it was growing as a share of GDP. But part of that was probably GDP was falling a lot, and government was staying at about the same level. So we're not actually getting like a big surge of government spending in the Depression years in the early stages uh, to help us get out of the Depression. But look what happens in the 1940s. See anything interesting that happens there? Early 1940s, World War II. Government grows from 16% 1939 up to 21, 39, 48% in 1943 and 1944. So that was a time when everything the government was bringing in and spending was on armaments, on war materials. And we were, half of what the U.S. economy was producing at the time was actually going for defense or for um, armaments and for war materials at the time. Notice what happened to consumption during that period. So you know they say that World War II got us out of the Depression. And in some sense it did, but the way we got out of the Depression is not a very pleasant way. We got out of it by spending a lot on, on bombs. Uh, a lot of lives were lost. Consumption was driven down dramatically, so the people that were at home, were not participating in the war effort abroad, were skimping and saving and living very meagerly. It looks like the economy grows dramatically because GDP goes up suddenly, and so we get this big surge in the growth of GDP. All that's good, right? Well, not necessarily when the reason it's going up is because we're in the midst of a great calamity and a great war effort that's leading to death and destruction both internally and elsewhere. So it's not the most pleasant way, of course, to get out of a recession. All right, so you can see some of that uh, information there uh, in this data. Now, the last thing that I want to draw your attention to before we finish today is I want to go back to the national income identity and highlight an element of it is of some importance. So gross domestic products equal to C plus I plus G plus exports minus imports. I want to focus on this last term, exports and imports. Move it over a little. Now first of all, and this is a distinction I'm going to make more explicit uh, next time. Uh, when we talk about exports and imports, we're talking about exports of goods and services, GNS, and imports of goods and services. We're going to see that there is multiple ways in which we can measure the difference uh, between exports and imports. And we're going to walk our way through all of those different measures next time in class. 
But what I mostly want to focus our attention on is this last term, minus <coughs> imports. There is a strong presumption in the world and in policy circles and by casual observers that imports represent a drag on the economy. That the more we import from the rest of the world, the more jobs are lost. You'll hear that all the time. And loss of jobs pulls down the gross domestic product and the standard of living of people within the economy. If imports grow, gross domestic product is going to be negatively affected. And I can see that that's true by just looking at this identity. I've got GDP is equal to C plus I plus G plus EX minus IM. So therefore, if IM goes up, GDP has to go down according to this identity. Hmm. Well, let me show you something else. And this is a way in which this data will often be analyzed and reported. Okay, I'm going to show you something. Uh, if we go to the national income accounts on our syllabus here, and go down to um, here. U.S. National Income and Product Accounts. This is the BEA.gov website. All the data that I just presented to you on a table comes from this site. And you can get lots of information available at your fingertips by going here. I'm going to look at interactive tables, GDP, and the National Income and Product Accounts. Click on that. I'm going to click on Begin Using the Data. I don't know why they have that page. Domestic Product and Income Accounts. And here's all sorts of tables that you could look at. Now, I want to focus our attention on contributions to percent change in the real gross domestic product. Now, these are growth rates that we're measuring. So when we look at the top here, we're looking at first, second, third, fourth quarter of 2014, 2015, and 2016, respectively. These are the growth rates that were reported in those individual quarters. The latest quarter of data that we have is the second quarter of 2016. Um, that is, what, April to, uh, to June? And it reports a total growth of gross domestic product in real terms, counting for inflation, of 1.1%. Okay, that's a pretty <coughs> abysmally slow growth rate. 1% uh, is not what anybody would like. They would like something more like, say, this value back in the third quarter of 2014, 5% in real terms. That's a nice, healthy growth rate. And 4% before that. So we had a couple of really good quarters, but look, minus 1.2, followed by 4, followed by 5, declining, kind of steady at 2, then down to 0.9. So things are not as rosy as we might like or might prefer if this is our measure of interest and what we care about. Now, what this breakdown does here is it breaks down the individual components of GDP and says to what extent does this number, say consumption, contribute to the 1.1% total growth? And it's additive in the following sense. I should be able to add 2.94 to the minus 1.67 that investment contributed, and all of these numbers added up according to the identity should get me to the 1.1% that I got in total. <coughs> now, what this is telling me for consumption is is that consumption contributed almost 3% growth. Consumption, which is 70% of the economy, grew by 3% per year. A lot of production was taking place and that was adding, contributing to the 1.1% growth of our national economy. But investment, you'll see here, actually fell in total size. It pulled down the growth of GDP because investment was not a major contributor. It was falling. Um, during that past quarter. So it contributed minus 1.67. Okay. Let's go down to exports and imports. Exports contributed 0.14% to that 1%, 1.1% growth up there. While imports, interestingly here, contributed minus 0.04. Now that data in this last quarter is not very interesting. So let me go back to a period where it's a little bit more interesting, like this, fourth quarter of... Um, uh, what is that, 2014, this number here. Minus 1.74. The way that a lot of folks will interpret that, minus 1.74, is that imports caused a drag on our gross domestic product growth by 1.74%. If imports hadn't grown as much during that quarter, GDP would have grown instead of at... 2.3%, uh, it would have grown at um, almost 1.75% uh, more. 
would have grown a lot faster. So growth of GDP was pulled down because imports grew so rapidly in that particular quarter. Imports caused the loss of GDP. Okay, is it true or is it not true? It looks right because it's there in the data. And we did the breakdown and they're, you know, they know what they're doing here. They did the breakdown and this is what they come up with. Okay, but here's what's being missed from this exercise. We go back to this particular term. The reason why imports is being subtracted off here at the end is because of the measurement, the way in which we're measuring the other variables in the identity. We look at consumption, for example, the C term. Consumption is defined and measured as consumption expenditures. That means it's total value that consumers or households spend on consumption goods during the quarter or during the year. Now, when we measure that, we do not make distinctions between whether the goods they're purchasing at the retail level were actually produced in the country or not. So if, for example, a household goes out and buys a foreign-made car and it gets counted as part of our gross domestic product, as it gets counted as part of our consumption, in other words, because it's a consumption expenditure by a household. But that consumption expenditure by the household is not a consumption expenditure on a U.S. produced good, and GDP is supposed to be U.S. GDP. That is just production of goods that were produced here within the country. So really, this consumption term is the consumption of domestically produced goods and plus the consumption of foreign goods. So all of the foreign products, the clothing, the automobiles, the whatever, vacations that you took abroad, anything that you did where you consumed things which were produced abroad is getting measured in that consumption term in our national income identity. But we don't want it there because it's not a measure of something that was produced within the United States. The same thing is true for investment. Investment has a domestic component, but if you buy, say, a foreign-made microscope or something for your business, or some sort of piece of equipment that was produced abroad and you bring it in and use it in your business, we do want to count that as investment that's going into the productive capacity of the country. But it's not a part of our gross domestic product. So we've got to get rid of it somehow. We've already added in foreign consumption, foreign investment, foreign government even, because the government is buying goods and services abroad in some respect with our foreign embassies and our um, foreign military bases and whatnot. So the government is spending things on foreign products. Even exported goods might have some intermediates that came in from abroad, were reassembled here in the country, and then exported back out again later on during the year. So all of these components up here have foreign production that we don't want to count as part of our gross domestic product. Therefore, we've got to subtract off imports at the end of this identity in order to get a measure of just our own domestic production. Now here's where the problem with interpretation comes in. If I asked you, in terms of this identity, let's say, all else equal, imports go up by a million dollars. What happens to gross domestic product in this identity? Huh? Nothing. <coughs> Doesn't change at all because a million dollars is going to get measured maybe in the consumption term as well as the import term. So a million is going to be added to two terms, one of which is positive, one of which is negative, and they're going to cancel out. It's not going to have any impact whatsoever on the gross domestic product. In the same way, imports in the aggregate do not have to have any immediate impact upon gross domestic product in the aggregate. It doesn't have to work that way. But we're misled into thinking there's a direct relationship because that's the way we write it up because that's the standard convention. So here's another example where the way in which the data gets presented to us can often lead to what seems like a reasonable interpretation that can at the same time be dead wrong. And we need to be cognizant and aware of, of some of those discrepancies and those distinctions. I've got a few more minutes. And I want to just sort of talk a little bit more generally about the state of the international economy. First of all, 
In the readings, like I had said, you're going to read a little bit about the history of a few important recessions in the United States, um, and that also affect the world. Um, so one of the, you know, uh, most of that was written up um, shortly after the financial crisis hit the United States in 2008. 2008 was a kind of a defining moment economically. It has really changed the nature of the U.S. economy and the international economy in some fairly fundamental ways. Um, so much so, I would say, that kind of our method of analysis and understanding the economy um, has to go through some important changes as well. Models we have used to understand the economy prior to 2008 don't seem to work quite as well in our understanding of the post-2008 economy. Things have changed pretty dramatically. Now, in terms of a real quick growth history, the U.S. economy sank fairly rapidly in, in its GDP in 2008, 2009, and early 2010. <coughs> we went into a pretty severe recession where the unemployment rate rose up to over 10% of the workforce. In previous recessions, and you can look in the data um, on, uh, in the notes, in previous recessions, we very often had deep recessions with high unemployment and recovered very, very quickly from those. Growth rebounded, economy grew rapidly, jobs came back, workers went back to work, and within a year or two, the economy would be back to its previous self, um, kind of chugging along and doing well for people. But that didn't happen this time. The unemployment rate stayed high, for a long period of time, and it very slowly and sluggishly came down to what is now a very respectable, less than 5% um, unemployment rate in the U.S. economy. So things are looking better, but they've taken a long time to get to those rosier outlooks. But at the same time, the U.S. economy is not growing at a very rapid rate either. 1% per year, with a 0.8% in the last quarter, looks like things are slowing down. We have not had a recession of any sort since 2009 or so. And so six or seven years down, that's often the stage in which economies start to contract and kind of recover. But we're in a different era, and it's very hard to know where the US economy is going. Now, we look around the world. Europe has been suffering from some dramatic adjustments and some changes taking place there. It's got a problem and has had a problem with the Greece economy, the Greek economy. and. Um, uh, the amount of external debt that Greece has to the rest of the world is more than they can bear, really. And they're being pushed and pulled to maintain their contracts and to make their repayments of past debt and to, um, to live up to their pre previous promises. But Greece can only do that by very greatly reducing their own standards of living and contracting their economy, possibly for a very long period of time. Hence, they're not real happy about that. The rest of Europe itself is struggling along. They've got problems with migration and immigration from other parts of, um, of Europe and Asia. And we've got the latest thing, which is the Brexit. The leaving of uh, Britain from the European Union is a shock to the European markets and a shock to the world markets. And it's generating lots of uncertainty about the prospects for growth and vitality in the European Union in the near future. Not quite sure what's happening there. Now, in some other countries around the world, after the recession in 2008-9, a couple of countries did quite well. And two of them were Brazil and China. They continued to grow at very rapid rates. They seemed to just avoid the problems associated with the crisis in Europe and the United States. And they continued to do well. Things have changed, though. Brazil is in a deep recession right now. They've got political problems at home. Their GDP is contracting, unemployment is rising tremendously. China is still doing well by most measures. They're still growing, a reported 6 to 7% per year. And that any country in the world would take and would love to have that, that, that level of growth. But China's economy has been slowing dramatically and has an enormous number of internal problems that are going to continue to pose problems for China going forward. We've got some disputes and some issues to talk about trade-related with China, and we're going to touch upon many of those as we work our way through this first half and later halves of the course, the uh, second half of the course. But it's worth noting that a lot of the commentary about China that may have been valid three or four years ago is very different right now because the Chinese economy is in a very different place today than it was three or four years ago. And there's great causes for concern about the health and vitality of the Chinese economy moving forward. Um, so I'm going to leave you today 
with a little bit of that doom and gloom. Um, but hopefully with a little bit of interest in kind of learning how to understand the where we are and what the future prospects might be and what some of the controversies and issues are so we can make some sense of that. So come on back next time and we will continue on looking at the balance of payments and other issues related to national income accounts. Yeah.